First off, uh, I, I have to uh, apologize if I'm, I'm maybe not in my best form today because the vodka yesterday, <laughs> I don't know who handed it over to me. I don't know who handed it over to me. Yeah. Please, I'm already making apologies here. <laughs> the vodka, maybe. What? You can't hear me? All right. We have the same Damn. problem in them. They, they also drink vodka. <laughs> so the vodka, yeah. Um, but I really did it only for you guys, you know. I was cheering the Polish team. So I'm, I'm basically suffering here for you. However, I can tell you that when I'm a bit hungover, I also tend to be a bit grumpy. So please, no controversial questions, yeah. My talk is about Silicon Valley to Silicon Alley, turning American startup know-how know -how into a European success story. Um, but before I come to that, I want to introduce myself. This is me, or this was me uh, in 1996. I'm a, a student, I was a student of uh, ancient history, Greeks and Romans. And um, you see us feasting there, uh, a true Roman meal uh, after the cookbook of Lucullus. So that's how I started out way back then. That was when I had my first uh, internet seminars at the university in Berlin. And uh, as a history student, I'm obviously interested in many things, um, not only the internet. One of the things that I'm really interested in is actually Poland. So Polish history, for example. So uh, while I'm here to talk about the internet in a way, um, I'm also up to if you know, any one of you wants to discuss the Polish crown versus the Polish schlachter with me, or you know, um, um, dressing habits of the Polish gentry in the 16th century, I'm up for it. And um, there's a few things that I love about Poland. Uh, one of them is definitely this. What's that? Does anyone know? It's uh, one of the best things about Poland. You may not know it, but uh, every time that I'm here, I try to have a big heap of that. So much about my relationship with Poland. Now to the topic at hand. What's happened in uh, Europe in the past 12 years or so, after I failed with my first startup in the year 2000, is that some rules have actually changed for the better, um, in a way that you guys can also profit from it. Uh, and I want to tell you how, essentially. It's still a bull ride, though. In the year 2000, when I failed with my first startup, the usual habit was to carve out a big idea of what you presume to be a big idea, and then more or less throw money at it. We all know the big stories of uh, companies going down and pulling hundreds of millions with them. This has thankfully changed. Now it's the other way around. That's the way how we live these years in, uh, in Europe. You have quite a lot of ideas and you have little money. And uh, with the possible exception, obviously, of the Silicon Valley, where you still have large sums that are being invested. Now, many people think that this is a bad thing. And uh, for many years in the 2000s, not much happened in the um, in the German or in the European venture scene because there was not mu much money around. But these days, many companies out there, and especially many companies in Berlin, and I'm sure here too, have adapted to this, to this new situation, that you actually have to deal with good ideas but little money. If you look, take a closer look at uh, the way this money is dispersed, you will find out that, I mean, that is a bit random, you know, that's not uh, complete. But if you look at it, there's like, a handful, like seven or eight sources of venture money that all cater at the seed market and only very few that will give you more money just to expand. So there's many opportunities to get in this uh, red line of, of, uh, of money if you manage to get in the loop. And many people who will support you there with the first steps how to build a company. And many say that it has never been easier than now to get um, an idea funded in, in the early stage. It's still as hard as it always was to expand and, and get massive money into it. But to this, for these uh, first steps, you have a lot of opportunities out there. And this is taken from a conference that I held two weeks ago, a startup day in, in Berlin, where we had uh, eight VCs on stage. Seven of them represented the first uh, seven um, pillars here. We had everything from, um, from crowdfunding to uh, media for equity, where you don't actually get money but advertising space on TV or radio, 
in order to, you know, for you to give away some, some percents of your um, startups for. And all these were very clear about the, what they were looking for and how they could help you to turn your idea into a company. However, all of them said that you know, it will only go to a certain level after which they simply don't have the money anymore. But the good news is that at the moment, it's really easy, comparatively easy, to get these first steps on the road if you do it right. And I want to show you how you best do that and how we can turn these ideas or these venture mechanisms that have been invented in the Silicon Valley that come from the Silicon Valley culture, how that can fuel also uh, a European startup culture. The question is, how do you get your idea or the company that you want to uh, build in that loop of, of the guys who hand you out money for, for your first step? And there's a few easy points to remember that all of you should apply to whatever idea you have. One, and you may have heard this before, but it can't be stressed enough, you need actually to be solving a problem, a pain point. This guy is shouting out with frustration and pain. And that's in a way how you should feel about something that you want to build a company on. It can be traffic jams, it can be lack of hot water in the shower, what do I know? Yeah? It can be the state of the Polish transport system, anything. But it needs to drive you crazy. You want to go out there and solve this problem so urgently that you can't think of anything else. The first thing that everybody I know, especially the people who intend to give you money, will always ask you is, like, what are you crazy about or what are you mad or angry about? What's your pain point? If you have a good answer to that, you're already halfway in the door of, of any VC. If that's credible, think again and again about what your true story is. These days, people who just say, well, I'm a blogger and I've kind of redesigned the blog software for my readers, you know, easier to follow, you know, solve a problem on the internet that the internet itself created. That's not kicking it anymore. You need to have a solid pain point. Secondly, you need to be very, very loud about it. Tell everybody you know, everyone, no matter where you go, what you want to do, what your plan is, what your pain point is. Stealth mode is so 90s. And you know, uh, nobody, wants, nobody takes it seriously anymore. If, if you walk up to someone and say, hey, there's this great thing that I'm working on. There's this great program coming out in a couple of weeks, but I can't tell you, you know. Everybody will take you for a fool because the attitude behind it is, is like, you know, again, 90s. Uh, I know something that you don't know. I have something secret. And I don't want to let you know only, you know, I want to let you know only in a certain point. However, we live in a digital age where everything can be Googled. There are no secrets anymore out there. So be as loud as you can. Shout it in the face of people. I need to tell you that I want to fix the problem with the lack of hot water. By the way, showers in this hotel. I just had a shower yeah, to uh, kind of wash away the vodka from, from yesterday. Why do hotels always have showers that necessarily soak the entire room when you take a shower? What is so hard about making a shower that actually works as a shower and not, you know, turns the whole room into a sauna? Is that really so difficult? The whole room is a shower. It's just a big shower. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a solution. But it soaks everything, the toilet paper too. I mean, think about it. That's one of the pain points, right? Shout about it. I've, I've just done that now, yeah? I had the shower, I had a bad experience, I'm shouting to you. Solve that, guys. Third thing. Competition, and you've heard that before, I think, as well. The a big mistake that immediately makes you recognizable as a fool is to tell people in the face that whatever you're doing is unique in the world. We have no competitors. If you tell that to anyone, they will go like, okay, there's a door. Because especially in the digital world, everything has already been tried. And if it, nothing in, in your field is out there, it's, there's probably good reasons for it. Somebody else has already failed with it. Something is wrong with your business model. If somebody walks up to you and says, hey, the shower thing, for example. And, and I go like, there's no solution in the world. You know, people will think I'm crazy because there is saunas out there. There is cabins, proper shower cabins out there. So there are a lot of obvious solutions. Some are not as obvious, but you need to think about what your competitors are and turn that into a strength. Because what people want to hear is actually from you is, yes, there is competition. However, they're failing to solve this and that problem. Or the business model is not good enough. And I have found a specific solution to make that better. That's the way how you should be dealing with, with your competitor, competitors. If you see yourself like this guy standing in an empty field without any competition around you, then you're probably blind because there always is competition and you need to address that openly. Fourth point, market. 
Another easy mistake that, that people make if, if they haven't really thought their business model through is just to grab any random number out of the sky and say, hey, I'm addressing the German market as such. Yeah? That's like 23,000 billions of whatever currency. And I want 5% I want five percent of that with whatever I'm doing. You're a total fool the moment that you speak uh, about it that way. What you want to do instead is take the bottom-up approach. You want to tell people, well, the service that I'm building, the product that I'm building, will generate per transaction a certain sum. That can be half a cent or a cent. But people will use it a million times, giving me 100,000 euros per week, whatever. You actually need to be talking about this little guy in the corner, not about the globe. If you can put it that way, that, that it goes like, a million people use my service for half a cent a day and the number um, is increasing so that builds a market for my product over the course of a year that is this and this big. That's the way to do it. Do it the other way around. Describe some strange, huge, golden market and just pretend you can get a percent of this. You're a fool again. Don't do that. Think about the common man in the street. And if you, can't, if you don't have data about it, try it yourself. Go out there to the supermarket, talk to your neighbors, try to sell them your product and ask them how much they want to pay for it. That's what we want to hear. Fifth point, whatever you do, leave the cellar or your living room as early as possible and go out there and test it. Cut it out from cardboard, whatever you can do. Yeah? Do a dummy site, form it from, what's that, Knetmasse? Uh, putty, yeah. Build it from Lego, whatever. You know, build it, get it out there, make a video how t you take it out there. Confront your potential customers with it, and document every single step you take. Because if you can walk up to someone willing to, willing to give you money and can show him that you already tried it, that you tried to sell it, that you got feedback, that uh, you even already incorporated um, features uh, or additional features, made corrections from the feedback you got. You've got a great story. People will listen. Because only very, very few people out there actually do that. Most people stay in the living room and build, you know, take a WordPress um, uh, template and, and build what they can. And only when the whole thing is done, they actually go out and find out if people want it. If you do the opposite thing from the very start and collect the, your findings and document them and present them to other people, you could be standing here because that story alone is interesting enough. And uh, venture capitalists will be interested in that too, because it's entertaining, it's intellectually challenging, it's a cool story, and it's fun too. So whatever you do, test it out there, <laughs> test it again, and then test it again. The way you do that, the testing process, the development of your idea, and that's something that probably most of you are already using, uh, I only want to encourage you in uh, you continuing to use it, is uh, a milestone-based approach, because that's also where venture capital um, works along uh, the same lines. You will never these days get like 5 million euros to build the final product. You will always get some money to do the first step, then some more money to do the second step. And if that's the way you're working on your idea too, simply not trying to achieve everything with one throw, but rather seeing what you can work on the next week or in the next months, the next three months, define milestones and work with also failure after these three months. If after three months you haven't achieved what you wanted to achieve, that's a good story too. Be open about it, document it, tell it to people you want to work with and say, look, while working on our product, we found out in the third milestone that we had been too positive about our assumptions. And here's the results and this is what we're going to change about it. So milestone-based approach, that's the thing. And it's also more fun and it's less frustrating than always having this huge mountain in front of you of, what, of the things that you want to ultimately achieve. If when you've done all this, and only then the time has come to put all your findings and your ideas and what you know about your product and your idea into a, a simple ABC alphabet. And um, I guess you will get the presentation after I'm done, so you, can, you don't need to you know, write this down if, if you're interested at all. You can read it later. I've put together an alphabet of um, how the story that you want to tell about your product and your uh, service should look like. It starts easy enough. My company A is building a defined product B that helps a defined target group, not all girls, a defined target group C to solve burning problem D using a unique approach E. 
if you can put your idea or your product into this sentence and bring it across in a, in a convincing way, you're halfway there. The other half is now, a single transaction makes F euro, which creates a market size of G euro that grows annually by H percent. What I love most about this is I, and I'd like you to contribute J. And in this story, if you can count it down from A to J, all the points made are there. Your personal involvement, the pain point, what's your unique approach, how much money are you going to make, and all this in a tangible way. Who are you selling this to? The moment that you can honestly and credibly tell yourself and your friends and everybody around you this story about your product, you're in. You will still get turned down by many people who don't want to give you their money or who don't want to be your business partners. But afterwards, everybody's going to say, hey, well, I can't give them my money, but they're actually pretty great. Maybe this is something that you know, some other friend should be uh, in contact with. This story, if you can tell it about your product and not lie, you're onto something. These are all mechanisms, if you will, that we can take from the, from the Silicon Valley. This is the way how I just was there three weeks ago. This is the way how most entrepreneurs uh, that you meet over there uh, come at you and, and tell you their story. At least ones where you immediately see, well, they are really onto something. So this is something that will also help you from Poland or from all over the world to be heard. It's something like a universal language. If you come with a story like this to Berlin, for example, then you can win over people as easily there as you can here, because that's what we want to hear. So there it is again. Just one more second. Yes? Right. Yeah. You don't need to write this down because you're going to get the presentation. <laughs> and I'm summing it up in the, in the next slide too. So it's pain point, volume, competition, market, test it, do it in milestone and pitch it well. If you follow this path, and that will probably for most people take eight weeks or something, if you're really into, uh, into it and if you're really onto something, obviously, then you're there and then you have a, the, the best chances out there that you can possibly have uh, over the course of the next year or so while money is still available. Now, I've told you that um, I want to build or that, that I'm about building a bridge or, or making the, the knowledge that comes from America, from the Silicon Valley, usable over here as well. And as you can probably see, I'm from Berlin, yeah? I put on the t-shirt for you. Um, and that's obviously what we're trying to build in, in, in Berlin. The company that I'm currently starting, uh, Berlin Startup Academy, aims to be the most beautiful, poetic, powerful, influential startup entrepreneurship school uh, that the world has ever seen. And it really um, comes from the idea to add something even better to all the stuff that we're taking from the Silicon Valley. Because with all the entrepreneurship spirit that we have here, there's still a few things lacking. And one of the most fundamental things is like this catapult that throws ideas up there and, and gets them a lot of money and, and makes them you know, worldwide. And uh, the way that I want to uh, address this is something that I hope that you will be or might be considering to join as well. In Berlin, we've already created something like a mini valley, not in terms of money. I mean, the comparison has been drawn many times and it's, it's much, much smaller. But I would say from the spirit and from the ease of conversation, from you know, bringing in ideas, walking up to people, talking to them, everybody helping you out, passing you on to more contacts, we're pretty much there. It's, it's pretty much a family uh, where everyone who makes a good statement, a good pitch, a good product is instantly well known and everybody wants to meet him or, or, or her. And that counts for you guys too, from Poland, from Eastern Europe, from, from Prague, wherever you're from. So this is, for once, an invitation to come over and join us and tell people in the street, more or less, about what you want to do, what you want to achieve, and then see what happens. Torstrasse, by the way, that's like the main... Th Who of you has ever been to Berlin? Who knows Torstrasse? I've lived in Berlin. Oh, you've lived in Berlin, all right. So a few guys know it. Torstrasse is like a street in Mitte where... Yeah, Exactly. So that's one. And this is the essential point. We've already heard uh, from Anastasia about Google. Now, I think that this is a valiant approach by Google to uh, set up shop over here and support entrepreneurship. However, 
you know, it sometimes works better and sometimes not so good if you have like a company that's basically based on another continent, in another time zone, with totally different ways to work and involve that into something very, very specific, very, very local, that involves local people who not, may not even be you know, fluent in the language that the big corporation speaks. Nonetheless, I think it's very valuable. However, what I think that we need to be doing is involve the assets, the big assets that we have over here in Europe, into uh, our creation of innovation and uh, functioning startups. While we don't have the likes of Oracle or HP or Google, uh, that throw millions uh, at startups and, and fuel part of the Silicon Valley, which is great. What we do have is other world-beating corporations. And mainly I'm talking about German corporations here. Uh, Siemens is just an example. It could also be Bertelsmann Group or it could be Mercedes-Benz. All these companies have tons of cash. They have a massive out outreach. They have millions of customers. And what I want to do, what Berlin Startup Academy wants to do, and what you're invited to help me with, is drawing all these European world-beating corporations into the startup scene and be our Google, our local Google though, with money, with uh, sales support, with uh, structural support, and thus leverage what, what, you know, in the Silicon Valley, companies like Google leverage. We have focus, we have speed, we have a growing class of young entrepreneurs that's at the moment totally detached from the big corporations and the money and the opportunities that you can get, get through big um, co corporations out there. This is going to change. This is going to change over the next year. That's at least my goal. And it looks pretty promising because on the other side of the table, the big corporations have problems too. They lack drive, they lack innovation. Look at the telcos, you know, they just stare amazed at companies like Google or Facebook and see how quickly they develop new products and how they bypass them. And, and you know, get them out of the communications market. This needs to stop. There's uh, initiatives all over the place in big German corporations. They're called entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship programs. They need to come out of this corner. And we can help them. You guys can help them. By attaching our focus and our speed to the outreach and the money that's actually there, but that's at the moment not connected. That's what Berlin Startup Academy is all about. Joining the manager and the punk, if you will. And I think that we can do this all over the place. It took me a while to get here yesterday <laughs> because the plane left Berlin. Then uh, the pilot noticed that the landing gear was not uh, retracting. So after 10 minutes, he went like, okay, so we're going to land again in 10 minutes in Berlin. Interesting, yeah? Starting 9, nine o'clock in the morning in Berlin, landing in Berlin, 9.30. Yeah, I was... I was wondering too, I mean, why can't we just go on when like, the, the landing gear is out, so we will land, you know, why not in Krakow? No idea. But um, these days, um, hmm? yeah, I could have driven, I mean, it's eight and, eight and a half hours by train, that's crazy. But it has already started, you know, like when, when, when I uh, meet people in Berlin, I'm, I'm always amazed and, and happy how many Poles, how many Czechs, how many Russians are there and already joining the discussion because distances are not as you know, far as it seems. And this language that I talked to you about, these, these ways how to develop an idea and talk about it, that's universal. Any one of you can do it. Uh, and if you can do it, you're basically in our family. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is, come join us uh, and help and profit from what we're building in Berlin, which is not only you know, some venture capitalists in coming into Berlin from, from other countries, that's something you read about, but which is also the um, opportunity to draw the big corporations that we've already only been watching from the, you know, in the, in the, in the stock market, to draw it into uh, our business and, and profit from it. You guys from Poland should be profiting from the outreach of Mercedes-Benz. Simple as that. Krakow obviously is also included. So this is basically already the end of my talk. There's like two things that I wanna offer you as a follow-up. I'm here like with two hats on in a way. The first thing is about uh, Berlin Startup Academy. So if you want to, if you're interested how you can uh, get involved, then please talk to me about it. The other thing is I'm also here representing uh, a new Deutsche Telekom corporate incubator, which is called Hubraum. It has been launched four weeks ago and I'm a mentor there. And it's 
the, the reason why I'm uh, representing it is because it's a precise example for what we all should be achieving. Deutsche Telekom is setting up an incubator and investing up to 300,000 euros into people like you. And they're doing this by incorporating people like me or any other knowledgeable person uh, from, from the real world, not from the corporate world, to make the companies in this corporate incubator as good in the real world as they can possibly be. So if you're interested in how to get into this program, how to get in touch, um, you would have to come to Berlin. That's the downside. Hupom is not supporting companies you know, that set up shop in Warsaw or uh, Minsk. So you need to be there. It's basically the program is um, normally you stay in this incubator for six to 12 months. And during, to that, during that time, you have like between 150,000 and 300K. And it's not something that uh, you're supposed to, you know, it's not like a startup school. It's, it's more like an, a, 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 an incubator that helps you raise the first money and, and come up with the first product and then get bigger money afterwards. What does it cost us? Nothing. Of course, nothing. No, they're very open about it. I mean, it used to be the case that uh, telcos were only looking for telco-related uh, innovation. But uh, with Hoopon, that's not the case. Any digital company can, um, can join. Um, more question in a second. I'm already done with this. I wanted to say thank you for being here. And I'm really happy to be in touch with you. And uh, I will always do everything that I can to you know, let our family grow also in the places where Bigos comes from. <laughs> and again, uh, if you want to talk to me about Jan Sobieski, for example, like Polish history, I'm up for it too. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, questions. Sorry. Do you want to ask something? So, so, so I can go there and I go to this. Uh, I see you saying there's a five month thing, and I was just Googling you while you were talking. And uh, October 26th, uh, 12th, and March 29th uh, on 13th. Five months tour, and there's a prize of 10,000 euros. <laughs> The business model, yeah. yeah. Um, the business model of Berlin Startup Academy is um, not so far away from most of the accelerator programs you know. Um, you have to graduate, in order to graduate from Berlin Startup Academy, you have to form a company. If you already bring one, that's cool too. From this company, you have to hand over 4% uh, to Berlin Startup Academy. Um, you do have to pay an, a fee to get in, indeed, a thousand euros. 1,000 euros. However, those of you who make it to the end, who graduate, who start a company and, and you know, become an alum, alum of Berlin Startup Academy, you get the money back twice. So you put in 1,000, and if you're successful, you get back 2,000 from me. And these 2,000, however, you have to invest directly into your company, solving your next biggest problem. At that point, that may be doing your first Facebook marketing campaign to see if your uh, product actually is marketable or Start, a, start an HR campaign, finding a technical co-founder, or maybe 2,000 euros to um, build your first prototype. So that's basically the deal. You, um, as, a, as a founder, you give away 4% and some money, but you get your money back. Right. And the 10,000 that you mentioned, there's a different model for corporate participants, because the way it's going to work is that you are going to sit down in benches like this, uh, cheek to cheek with uh, executives from Deutsche Telekom and Bertelsmann, and learning together and teaching each other how to turn an idea into a digital company quickly uh, and uh, building a network thus because if you've worked with somebody on something as i always put it if you've ever been under fire together that's how you build a network that lasts you know that's how you can that's how you can later call the guys also in the big corporation and say hey look we worked on our uh, this idea together now i'm in the stage that i need your help Definitely would. Uh, oh, that's not one here. That's too it definitely, definitely would. Um, you can incorporate in any country you want. So even if you have a, an Irish limited or a Polish, how do you call it? That's all fine with me. Spooka. Spooka. 
The only thing that you need to do is, is to be in Berlin at least once a week. Because um, the most important thing here is working with people eye to eye. It's not full time. Yeah? As opposed, for example, to startup bootcamp, you don't have to move to Berlin for like a couple months. You only have to be there once a week. How much activity is it for the Four percent. Exactly. Oh, for, um, for how long? What? For how long? For how long? For the entire oh, for well, it dilutes after a while, right? Um, the Hubraum, they n normally don't make exact statements about how much equity they take, but normally you can figure that out for yourself if you think about the evaluation of a company pre-money in the seed stage being around a million, maybe a little bit more, and you're receiving between 150 and, and 300K. You know, you can basically do the math for yourself. The entire program is in English. Uh, it is especially tailored for people like you uh, because we have so many expatriates in, in Berlin anyways. The entire program is in English, so one of the prerequisites that you need to bring is to be go as good in English as it takes to present your idea well and follow the program. All talks will be in English, all material, website, videos are all in English. So da hinten? No, me. Ah, you, okay. <laughs> So yesterday, uh, John Bradford talked about that we should have you know, many, many accelerators uh, in Europe. And um, I, I know that you worked with the Founders Institute previously, and, and now you're doing this. And you, you asked not to have any controversial questions, but what fun, I'm feeling better now, what, so what can... fun would this be if we couldn't ask controversial questions? Um, sometimes I feel like Startups try to apply for, let's call them tier one programs, okay, seed camp, et cetera, and don't get in. And then they say, well, I need something, so I'm going to pay for it, right? Because if I understand the Founders Institute model, you pay, right? And then if you continue, they get some equity. And if I understand your model, you, you pay for a weekend and, and you give the equity and then if you stay, you give up more equity or something like that? No, I try to put it, uh, it's, it's very simple. If you get accepted, you give me a thousand euros. If you don't make the program, if you drop out during the time, you lose the thousand euros. However, if you make it and stay on to the end and incorporate, you get back 2000 euros. If you make it to the end and finish the program with a company under your belt, you give me 4% of it. And uh, you know about the accelerator program and, and trying to get in easy. Um, the selection of people is basically like you would do it too. Nobody's interested in, in getting in people just because they pay you a thousand euros. A thousand euros is not so much money, you know. So the selection process is just the way how you would select entrepreneurs to, to participate. They need to basically be able to eventually answer all these questions, you know, the, the A to Z. They need to have a product, an idea that merits building a company from it. So, so, so maybe, I get, maybe I wasn't following it, the, the, this correctly, or maybe I'm thinking of a different program, but I thought I read some kind of an article where you pay to go for a weekend, and it's open to anyone, and this I isn't you. No, no, no. Okay, no. fine, excuse me. Oh, so let me, let me ask you a second part of that question. So I pay, so I'm a startup, I pay, I'm a startup and I pay a thousand euro for the, the classes, whatever. Um, I can understand that concept. It's like a school. The four percent. Um, so let me just let me just put my myself in the shoes of an entrepreneur. I'm giving up four percent of my company for the promise, I'm presuming, of mentoring. But as a as a individual who kind of thinks things through, um, I obviously being a mentor somewhere. Don't really do it for you know, the love of mentoring. So, how do you connect that four percent that I give to the Founders Institute to the mentors who you have? Well, I mean, are you are you giving mentors these, this equity, or what's the guarantee for me that a mentor is going to give me his time? Because I want some, I want something for that four percent outside of a promise, because promises aren't worth shit. That's right, and that's why I take these four percent only at the end of the program when you've already received all the mentoring, when you already got your money's worth. What if I'm not satisfied with it? Do I just not 
then you're basically screwed. <laughs> Look, I mean, at the stage that, uh, uh, that we're at, we're, we're looking at people who are just forming uh, or trying to form um, um, a, a company from an idea. At the end of it, the whole thing is, is really not very much worth. They still can fail. Many of them will still do that. So arguably, you could say, well, 4% of nothing is something that you can easily give away, right? So what are your mentors getting? The mentors are getting, well, my, the background of this is that already in the Founder Institute, uh, which I ran last year, uh, five companies from the first semester have been um, financed now with a seed round, and all five of them have been financed through mentors. So mentors get, um, get to know companies uh, and in a very early stage, and they participate in an education that will help these companies succeed. And so far it has worked many times, like in my experience, that this actually works, that, that people afterwards get into incubator programs, that mentors become business angels, uh, and, and thus profit massively from um, them having helped these companies to be created. In addition, there's uh, these partner programs like Hubraum. Hubraum will give away another 3% of the companies that get accepted into Hubraum to mentors. So if you, Paul, helped uh, you know, one of the companies or one of these ideas to become so good that they are accepted into Hubraum, for example, it could be you who gets 3% of a company that just has received an, a seed investment of 300K from Deutsche Telekom. That's something. There's no guarantees, but you know, taking in, uh, all this entire ecosystem into play, I think there's a lot of opportunity for mentors in this. Um, sorry, I, I think I have to stop anyways, right? The time has run out a long time ago. Do we have time for one more question? Last question on the show? Uh, no, that was, that was a great question, you know, and, and I'm not as hungover anymore, so you know, do what you like. <laughs> On one of the slides, uh, you show the type of investor called uh, Media for Equity. Uh, can you give some examples? Yes, there is a company in Germany called um, GMPVC, German Media Pool Venture Capital. It's the <laughs> stupidest name ever, yeah? And what they've done is they've, they went to German media companies like uh, N24, which is a news channel, a radio channel, and uh, you know, an ma outdoor marketer, and collected a pool of uh, marketing opportunities, if you will. And if you have a product that needs to be spread in the real world really quickly, you could obviously take your money and buy all these, uh, this marketing, uh, this outdoor marketing yourself, or you could go to this pool and say, look, I'm giving you 2% of my equity in return for uh, 500,000 euros worth of outdoor and TV and radio advertising. So that's the way they're doing it. Do, do you know any companies that actually use this type of uh, investment? I'm not their advocate. I can only tell you that uh, they have already funded uh, five companies that way. And they're all companies that have a, long, uh, a strong um, consumer outreach. So they really can use the outreach on, on outdoor media. And I don't know how successful they are. I mean, GM PVC has been set up something like nine months, ten months ago, so I suppose there are not yet the big success stories out there. I think I really need to, I mean... What do we have to see in Berlin? Why can't you use uh, online uh, training? There's so much good software out there now for online training, and would you consider in the future of actually having it be online? That's a good question. Um, would I want to, or c would I offer Berlin Startup Academy also online uh, without having, you having to go to Berlin? And the answer is no, because what's most important about this is actually you getting in touch and being under fire in the real world with real mentors, with real co-founders. It's not only about what you learn, it's mostly about how you learn it and how you turn it into reality. Thank you very much. You can always talk to me during the entire day. I'll be here, I'll be around. I'm happy to answer our questions. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat>